morning, everybody. Welcome to the Cape Cod Technology Council's Coffee Q&A. Uh, very excited with our guest today, Brett Banoff uh, from uh, the Mayflower Autonomous Ship. And I would like to turn this now over to our moderator, Robin Orbison from Cape Space. Robin. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to be back um, for the season for resuming our Q and A's, and we're really excited um, to kick off the Q and A season with a, a really cool speaker. Um, we're uh, very excited to welcome Brett Faneff, who is the brains behind a fascinating thing called the Mayflower Autonomous Ship, um, and uh, Brett is going to tell us uh, all about how he. Uh, conceived this concept and uh, what he's uh, hoping to accomplish with it. And he's got some great footage. So um, without uh, a lot of fanfare here, I'm just gonna turn it right on over to, um, to Brett. And um, Brett, um, would, do you prefer to take questions as we go along or hold to the end? Uh, usually I say it depends on the question. No, I'm kidding. I <laughs> to interrupt me. Uh, okay. If I don't, right. have to, I'll just ignore it. Okay, so uh, so everyone, feel free to drop your questions into the chat, and I will uh, I will um, get them to Brett uh, when he takes a breath. Okay, <laughs> Brett, take it away. All right. Well, here I'll see if I can share my screen. Hi, good 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 after, well, Good morning to you guys. It's afternoon for me, and and thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today, and I wish it could have been with the Mayflower Autonomous Ship. Uh, parked either in Provincetown or Plymouth, but uh, we didn't quite make it across on our first attempt. And I'll tell you about that as we go and when we're gonna be there, because we'll be there uh, in the not too distant future. So the Mayflower, Mayflower Autonomous Ship is, some of you may have heard of it. It's sort of what it says on the, on the label. It's a uh, sort of a homage to the original crossing 400 years ago of the Mayflower, Plymouth to Plymouth. And uh, oh, about, five, six years ago in a meeting here in Plymouth, UK, where I am, but I grew up in Massachusetts, so I'm a, I'm a Yankee, and I, I, I can uh, probably have a picture somewhere of me looking through the, through the, through the bars there uh, at the uh, Plymouth Rock when I was little on a trip down from my school. But anyway, um, uh, we were in a meeting four or five years ago and talking about ways to celebrate the 400th anniversary, and uh, it just popped up that someone was thinking about building a replica ship and I didn't think that was a very good idea. And to me, it seemed that we should do something that sort of took our inspiration for what we would do from the original crossing. And, and in that, I mean, sort of the, the risk that they took. Um, we can debate, I guess, whether it's a good or a bad thing. We tend not to think about the past so much, but think about the future of the marine enterprise. But we can, I think, all agree that it was an extremely uh, risky venture that the original travelers on the Mayflower undertook. So we wanted to be, I guess, take some risk and be inspired. And of course, building an autonomous ship with no people uh, isn't exactly the same magnitude of risk, but we wanted to sort of be inspired by that audacious move and think about what the next 400 years in the maritime enterprise might look like. So that 400 years from now, uh, maybe someone would look back on what we did and think that that was a watershed moment. So that's kind of a big ask, but to me, it seemed like the way to go. And we'd all sort of in this area in my company, uh, various countries, various companies are all looking at marine autonomy and sophisticated automation and ways to lower cost and raise safety for being at sea and autonomy and AI driven autonomy, in particular sort of right in the vanguard of that. So we, we decided let's build a fully autonomous ship and we'll give it a, what I said at the time, Captain Watson, you know, sort of being inspired by watching uh, IBM Watson uh, playing chess against Kasparov and, and being on Jeopardy and sort of being a bit naive about the state of AI systems at that time. And fortunately for us, we started talking about this uh, to anybody who would listen in presentations like this and many others. Um, and somebody from IBM in France saw it and thought that was a good idea. And that partnership has only grown and deepened over the past five years. And so it's really a, a labor of love between IBM and, and our nonprofit uh, company, which is based in, in uh, Connecticut called Promare, which has been around for about 20 years to facilitate uh, marine tech and, and sort of exploration at sea. 
And that's what this ship's about. It's about exploring the boundaries of technology from the AI and machine learning perspective and exploring our oceans and our climate gathering data and producing information that we then give away so that people can have a, a better understanding of what's actually happening in our planet. So feel free to jump in. I'm gonna see, oh, it won't let me go forward. Ah, there it is. So again, just to go back to uh, a little bit more succinctly about what we're doing, um, we had some sort of top tier, three top tier goals. We had a technological goal, which was design and build a fully autonomous crewless ship that could independently traverse an ocean, in this case, the North Atlantic. But we've got some plans for sort of um, the Atlantic tra meridial transect all the way down to St. Helena and back, and then also over to the Pacific uh, and across the Pacific at a later date. And to do that, we wanted to develop an AI captain. The Watson guys didn't want a Captain Watson. They said it reminded them too much of Captain Watson on um, Whale Wars. So they didn't like that. They said, nope, that's, we don't, we want to design an AI captain. So we said, fine. And the idea was to sort of implement a state-of-the-art system that used all the instruments you're used to seeing. Let's see, radars and AIS and GPS and, and camera systems and, and many other types of uh, sensor fuse that data in, uh, into a structured set of perception, essentially. And then the ship could think about what it needed to do to achieve goals. And the goals, of course, we would provide. Um, and in this case, it was to cross the ocean and do research while it did so. But it doesn't have to have a direction. It can simply be to explore or to follow unusual things that it detects in the water, or different types of phytoplankton or copepods or zooplankton or temperature or um, component gas, gas component in the upper water, anything really that we want to do and quite a complex suite of sensors on board to do that. And again, that brings us to scientific goals. One of the things we have learned over the many years of doing research at sea is that it's extremely expensive. Um, and we don't, as a species, have the wherewithal or the desire to build as many ships as we might need to get all the data we want from the disparate parts of the ocean uh, so that we better understand our planet. These are profoundly expensive things to do. And also the areas where we really don't have data are quite hostile. Uh, and most of our data is biased to commercial routes. So we wanted to address that. And we thought if we could drive the cost down of getting data and process it on the edge um, so that we only had to ship back information uh, and we gave that information away, there would be a uh, it would be a good uh, a good deed and a good opportunity to sort of test the limits of that type of technology as well and see what kind of an impact we might have. Um, and of course, sort of the primary areas of interest to us for marine pollution, particularly plastics, um, marine mammals, so we can detect species and uh, do some counting on speciation and, and location of different types of uh, marine mammals, whales, uh, other pinnipeds, things like that. And then also look at sea surface state, temperature, and uh, the global ocean height. So looking at um, you're trying to provide really precise measurements for sea level change as well. And then work uh, in conjunction with satellite resources so that we can do some ground truthing in real time for the space-based assets, which are really vital for any oceanographic and climate work. And then, of course, I already spoke about the historic goal, which is to celebrate that first voyage uh, 400 years ago. Uh, and much like the original Mayflower, which had to turn back twice, we only had to turn back once. We're hoping we don't have to turn back again. So at least we're uh, historically uh, on piste. So let's see. So again, simple route. We're going to leave from the England. We're going to cross the Isle of Scilly, uh, head out to the Mid-Atlantic, across the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, sort of near the Titanic site. Uh, we don't intend to see it, so we're going to cruise over the top of it, uh, more or less. And that's just there. As a to give people an idea of where that is in relation to the ocean and what our route would be. And then we'll stop first in, in Provincetown uh, because the Mayflower originally did. And who wouldn't want to stop in Provincetown? Coolest place in Massachusetts to hang out. And then uh, I've been going there since I was a kid. So I, I, I have to stop there. And then after an, a, a, a sufficient course of rest and relaxation in Provincetown, we would head on to Plymouth. So we didn't make it this time, but we're going again uh, in the spring of 22. And this is still our more or less our planned route across the Atlantic. And so I spoke um, a little bit about AI and automation and putting things on the edge. And indeed, that's sort of what it is. When we, when we started the project, 
in 16, we weren't sure that we could put enough compute power uh, in the ship to do the things we wanted to do. So we started instead working with IBM and others to collect the data to build models that would inform us about the world around us so the ship could make decisions. So we spent about five years collecting radar and uh, automated information system data and uh, imagery data, both thermal and electro-optical from shoreside stations, from the Napoleonic forts offshore, uh, from little boats, from the pilot boats in the city of Plymouth here, um, which were great because they gave us a unique opportunity to, to do what, to, to model what they call the controlled crash several times a day when they come alongside a ship to transfer a pilot. So it's hard to get data like that without actually having a collision. Um, so we had all sorts of really lovely data that we could then make into models. And that those models then live out on the edge. They're deployed on little NVIDIA cards. Um, and then they're sort of in containers or dockers out on these cards and we can push new models or update the models in near real time to the ship through satellite comms when we have it. But the whole ship had to have all the capability out on the edge. It had to be able to see everything around. It had to understand where all those things were in relation to it. It had to then determine a safe path through them that also still helped it advance on its, its, its mission goal, which in this case is across the ocean. And it had to be able to do it without any communications back. Uh, and the reason we set that challenge so hard is because even with good communications, it's still very low bandwidth in the middle of the ocean. And fortunately for us, that once you're out in the middle of the ocean, as some of you probably know, there isn't a whole lot out there to hit. Um, but when you get close to shore, we have the opportunity to use higher bandwidth comms and we can directly download data. And if we need to, can actually take control of the ship like a great big remote control vessel. Although we don't do that very often, uh, only for docking if we absolutely have to. Um, so all that happens out on the edge because it's possible that the ship could be a thousand miles out to sea, unable to communicate with us contending with difficult weather and other traffic and have to make decisions not only about its posture relative to sea, sea state and traffic, but it may sustain damage, it may have problems uh, executing specific things. So it has to understand its own situation as well, how it, its own status, and then look at its goals and be able to synthesize out what it wants to do. So we do have a control center where we make all our models and we monitor it real time when we have comms and it sort of has a mailbox that we can check in and out of. And when we do have good comms, we broadcast all the status about the ship, including a remote view from the ship cameras, what it's seeing what it's see, and, and some other data uh, to our cloud uh, portal, uh, which is run by IBM. And we have a little funny little septopus. It was an octopus supposed to be, but when they drew it, they left the leg off. So it's a septopus. And I always tell people that we made that do that on purpose because it's a prime and that's important in encryption. But the truth is they forgot a leg. But anyway, we have a septopus that sits there and it's a, a very sophisticated uh, chatbot uh, that's been developed for dec well, over a decade now. Um, and it was sort of a man without a country. And now they've put it on a vessel and it can take rather sophisticated queries from the public about all the things that are happening to the ship and uh, answer them in, in real time. And then of course, we go back to uh, sort of an ed ed scientific teams get that data and then we also push weather data to the ship. The ship has a couple of weather stations on board as well. So it actually is providing some validation back to the weather company guys who are giving us sort of the, the gross weather patterns. And we're looking at the, the stuff right at the ship and comparing the data we're getting. And we found that to be quite valuable as well. And as I said, um, sort of a little bit more, uh, maybe a little more coherent here. We have all the sensors on the left, things you've seen if you spend time on boats. We use a tool called Maximo Visual Inspection, uh, among others, to sort of take all that unstructured data, uh, classify it, determine where everything is, move it over to uh, a really interesting deterministic rules-based engine mm -hmm. so we can sort of look at collision regulations relative to all the targets around our ship or all the other things around our ship, whether it's a buoy or a dock or a container ship or some flotsam. And an ODM or operational decision manager is kind of interesting because it's um, actually a financial tool that's been around about 20 some odd years grown out of expert systems. And it's a, a deterministic rules-based engine that you type rules into it in natural English and you set some hierarchies and you can then occasionally change those if you like, you can write new rules, 
but it also keeps an immutable record of the decisions it supports. So what it does is it looks at legal decisions. It says, well, here are my rules and here are all these things around me. It looks at every, the way we've repurposed it now for, for collision, anti-collision regulations. Usually it makes sort of billions of decisions a second in the financial market approving mortgages or credit charge transactions or Forex. And for us, we just make a few hundred decisions a day so we could take it out of the cloud and put it on a little single board computer. And what it does is sort of looks at our posture relative to all the other vessels or all the other things, and it determines if we're coal red compliant. And then it outputs a list of sort of legal allowable maneuvers the ship can make, which may include stopping or speeding up or turning or slowing down, any sort of thing you might imagine a vessel might do. And then each individual set of legal options is then moved for each individual target around us, which can be quite big when you're in a harbor, but very small when you're out in the middle of the ocean, move over to an IBM uh, tool called CPLEX Optimizer that also is used um, <laughs> vastly across many other disparate uh, industries. And then it synthesizes the sort of the dynamic path that we can plan through things. And it does this constantly, it never stops. It's constantly doing this. And uh, it uses a mission manager that keeps the sort of high level objectives. And then once it has the synthesized dynamic path plan, it speaks to the lower level systems like PLCs to affect a maneuver, to turn the propeller, to move the rudder, to turn machinery on and off, to start a pump, whatever it may be. And all that is managed uh, by IBM Edge Application Manager, which is a lovely piece of software. Uh, and all of it sits on Xavier Jets and Xavier devices other than a couple of single board computers. And then as we have intermittent connections, we, as I said, push things to the cloud, we push things to machine learning centers to process information that we get back or if we can pull data. And we're also looking at and sending back weather information. And so this is probably, I guess, what I would say a fairly typical narrow contextual AI in the sense that it's optimized to do a, a very specific thing. And it's a collection of sort of probabilistic models and deterministic uh, rules are, we think, elegantly put together with sensors and then lower tier automation systems that much like a human sort of have sort of a, a structure from the ground up from, from your body up to your sort of the theoretical mind. And um, it, it's designed in layers so that it can gracefully fail. So if we lose pieces of the AI system or, it's, or we lose the entire sort of higher level system, it still has a very sophisticated suite of automation that will allow the ship to navigate um, with some human input as to the detection of objects. And then below that, you could remotely control it if you can, if you can talk to it. But it's all designed, as I said, so that we can operate without any discussion with the ship if necessary, because our, even in the best of times, satellite communications, particularly near Earth orbiting iridium-based satellites can be spotty. Although we've had fantastic uh, luck with them and with some really novel uh, real-time end-to-end compression and decompression software, we've been able to pull up a huge amount of data, not the least of which is uh, visual imagery off the ship to, to broadcast online. I was saying earlier to, to somebody that I, I got up at three o'clock in the morning to look at what was happening at the on the ship one day, and uh, there were 30,000 people online looking at the camera feed as the boat was just sort of plowing through the ocean. Um, I, I really, it really made me wonder who all these people were um, and what, what, what they were doing up at, at three in the morning. But uh, it was fascinating to see. And even I got a little bit mesmerized by it. But sorry, I digress. Uh, maybe we could, if anybody has any questions, I could take a breath and take some um, before I talk about models. Uh, I'm going to jump in here with a couple of questions, Brett. Um, all right. So, first of all, um, so did you um you never um you never ended up naming the AI captain who just after Watson was shut down was wasn't a, a second runner up for that? No, it just sort of stuck. You know, we we have a, a product that we are offering to people that operate on manned surface vehicles, uh, but it's really a, a distillation of the mostly computer vision based object tracking detection classification and tracking system to avoid hazards at sea, but it it isn't really an AI system. Um, and we couldn't quite, not, nobody ever, I don't know why we didn't name it. I liked, I always liked Captain Watson and my, my chief software engineer 
has a little sticky note up above his desk where I called him like five years ago and said, you know, we need a Captain Watson, build that. And uh, he wrote, you know, Brett wants Captain Watson, stuck it on a wall, it's still there. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but we never, I don't know why it became the AI, it, it became a joke too. Everybody was saying AI, AI, I'm sorry, I, I, Captain. Um, sorry about that, terrible joke. But um, then we never named it. We named the ship Mayflower upon the ship and then the Septopus has a name, they call him Artie. Hmm. Uh, now I'm gonna I'm gonna show my 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 history gaps. Does anybody remember the name of the captain of the Mayflower? Oh, I did five minutes ago until you asked me. <laughs> oh. All right, let's let's move on from from all the things we don't remember from school. Um, so just I'm curious though, so those thirty thousand viewers. Um, so I, I are you able to tell where they're coming from when when people are watching? I'm sure smarter people than me are. Um, I. I, I was just logged in sort of as a viewer myself because I was like, all right, what's happening? Woke up, logged in, but uh, there's other people who can't sleep. Um, it, could be, but it could be in a part of the world where, you know, it's daytime. I'm sure, I'm sure but you know, it's, it was late for me. But, the, um, but uh, IBM tracked all that. And we, we were, I mean, we had people apparently from about a hundred different countries at any, you know, across the first mission. Um, and is that representative of like if you if you went I mean I know the, the 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 ship is not sailing right now but when it was sailing was that you know kind of what you were seeing on a regular basis or was there something special about that day? No, I think I don't know. There was a, a crisis of boredom uh, at that moment. The uh, it averaged about five thousand people. You know, most times I'd look at it, it was four, five thousand, three thousand, six thousand. That night it was thirty. It happened. It was a really nice night. It was very clear, and we had a almost full moon and and just a little bit of cloud, so it was pretty. So it may have been that it was just pretty uh, that night. But uh, yeah, that was that was a big number. But uh, I was always also still flabbergasted that we'd have you know five thousand people. You know, not nothing happened. You know, which is after, right? I mean, we're going to see some of that footage in a, in, a, in a little bit. So. Oh, I, I forgot to load that up. Yes, I'll yeah, have to. And before you go on, we've had some uh, some history buffs in the in the audience here who are weighing in. The captain of the uh, Mayflower was Captain Christopher Jones. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That, that would have been painful later. All right, I'm going to let you continue. Okay. Uh, I don't. Uh, oh, sorry, I've done something silly. Um, what, what have I done? This is why I shouldn't be allowed to do anything. Sorry about that. So um, underpinning all this, when we started, as I said, one of the most important things was models, model production. And so we needed lots of data. So we put lots of cameras and radars and AISs and all sorts of things all around Plymouth Sound where we are, out offshore on structures, lighthouses, Napoleonic era fortifications, on headlands, on pilot boats, on ferries, on our own boats, everywhere we could. And we were collecting all that data because what we needed to do was sort of be able to not only tell where it, what a thing was, where it was, we also had to track it across multiple cameras and, and infer some position for it. And then we also had to have metadata from it. So we had to have sort of a, an idea of, well, how, can, how does a thing like that behave so that we could put that into the path planning algorithms. Right, so what was expected movement, sort of predictive path. And then on top of that, um, and this, we had to then fuse all that data. So when you had optical images or thermal images of a ship or a buoy or anything else, you had a radar contact and you maybe, and you may or may not have had an AIS contact. And all of those things had to get fused so that you understood how many things you actually had to contend with. Uh, and unlike on a city street or on a lamppost or even on a car, um, those things tend not to have a lot of be very dynamic in the Z axis, but you know, ships are pretty dynamic things and they're moving around all the time. So it, it became quite challenging um, to get it all to work, but we collected hundreds of millions of images and we produced models that we then took to see and tested and determined how effective they were at classifying things and predicting movement or helping us predict movement. And then we could 
we created an auto labeling routine that could then ingest data more fast, more quickly, and help us refine our models. But all of this then was tested at sea on manned and unmanned vessels because we couldn't just take it for granted. And of course, we didn't want to just download somebody else's model because we wanted to know what was in our sausage. And we have dozens and dozens and dozens of discrete models for things like navigation markers and different types of buoys for different types of structures and, and for different types of ships and for different types of really annoying things that are hard to detect like stand up paddle borders, which if you teach a ship all about boats and then there's a person standing in the middle of the sea, which is what it looks like, it ignores that, which is not a good thing when you're maneuvering in a harbor. So we had to make special models about people on stand up paddle boards and kayakers and canoeists. And now the challenge, the really big challenging one for us is swimmers. Uh, fortunately, in the middle of the deep Atlantic, we never have to deal with that. But we are working on models of swimmers, uh, both in and without wetsuits, so that we can uh, avoid them uh, when we're out at sea uh, or in a harbor. And then all of those models and all of that data, and this is just sort of a graphical representation of where all those contacts are. So in this case, we're in Plymouth Sound. That's our home port where we're headed. The Mayflower is here, and it's got a closest point of approach that we set with sort of a vector as to what it's going to do. And then when you look at all these other tasks that have been, all these other things that are moving around, we, and we put a CPA around them based on our perception of risk, which is a sort of an amalgam of speed and consequence. And, and of course, it's, it's, it's vector, it's course. Um, this gives you some idea, just very simple. Thing. And one of the things over here that people wonder about is, well, why kayaks are very slow? Why is there such a huge uh, closest point of approach or sort of an exclusion zone around it? And that has to do with the hazard. If, if, if uh, the Mayflower comes into contact with a continental ferry or with a tanker, it's going to lose uh, because it's not particularly massive. But if it hits a kayaker, it could kill somebody. So we give them very wide berths. And all of this is just sort of a a very simple graphical representation of the math that underpins the thing. And, and this is a fairly calm day. Um, in the summer, we would have hundreds of discrete objects that we had to account for moving around constantly and not the least of which my favorite thing to hate, which is jet skis who apparently uh, want to die when they're out. <laughs> they just seem to be determined to cause havoc uh, when you have an unmanned vessel. I, I'm sure there's a statistical analysis we could do um, if you have an unmanned, and I'm sure there's a law or a rule we could infer that if there's an unmanned vessel at sea, there will always be at least one jet ski making you wonder if your math is going to hold up. Uh, but um, it's quite complicated. In this case, it's a very simple day. It was in the winter, so we didn't have much to worry about. But we have to map up sort of an optimal path through all these dynamic obstacles. And it's, uh, it's interesting work and it's challenging, but what we wanted the Mayflower to be able to do is not have to have a person do that. So a person could focus on um, insightful things like what the information is that we're getting means with regard to the state of the ocean or the science we're conducting. Um, and then to go to the science specifically, we had quite a lot of uh, science on the boat. It was sort of uh, their payload bays here for what we call research pods. And it was in large part, I suppose, dating myself. I was um, we were inspired by the space shuttle program, which uh, you know I grew up watching. I remember the first launch I ever saw as a child. And so we wanted to be able to hot swap in things like the space shuttle. Did. We wanted to give people an opportunity to produce equipment that they could then load up into the boat with very little uh, fanfare and very little difficulty, I should say. And, and we could plug it in and then run their experiments and see at greatly reduced cost. So we had three major bays, um, payload capacity, depending on the final load out of the boats was actually more like a thousand kilos, so about a ton. And we had a little bit of everything. We had physical sampling for the water. So episodically, the boat would take a, take a water sample and refrigerate it for later analysis. That could be triggered by time or location or by other data that came in. We did all sorts of water chemistry. Uh, pollution sampling was largely water. It was plastic. So we took physical samples and we could sieve it for plastic, but we also uh, deployed a, um, a holographic microscope, which is a fascinating thing. And it was another computer vision-based device and we would flow water through a cell and it would photograph, it would image the volume is a better way to put it with an extremely high speed, high resolution camera system. 
and it would then count all the things in that water of a certain size range. So all the plankton, we could count most of it down to a, certain, a pretty small size. And um, it could, in some cases, do real-time speciation. And then it could also detect microplastics if they were of a size that we could see with the camera. And then it would make a, an analysis of these things, give you data. So if you had all sorts of weird things coming in, it could look at temperature, it could look at salinity, it could look at chlorophyll, and it could look at uh, partial O2 and CO2 in the water. It could look at all these other diverse sort of instrument inputs, um, even time of day, which is important for different types of critters. Um, and then it might detect something unusual. And so we're getting to the point now with the AI stuff that when all these things are happening, it can, we're just on the cusp of getting it to the point where it can sort of recognize that something's anomalous. And we wanna to get to where we can have the ship itself make a decision um, to chase that because it's, it's so unique or so unusual that it says, ah, my humans are gonna to wanna to know about this. I'm just gonna go do it. So I still have enough power and enough capability and enough of a weather window to, to achieve my other mission, or even at some point get to a point where it doesn't have to achieve that mission. It can change its own mission to follow things that are truly unique. Um, and then water chemistry is kind of a fun one. We, we put a thing on called Hypertaste, which is a, they call it a digital tongue. It was developed uh, in partnership with IBM and a Swiss corporation and they they built the whole thing to detect uh, forged wines and brandies because apparently that's a problem uh, in the market. So when they had got this thing working and they could run samples and determine if it was uh, what it was supposed to be, they realized that they built sort of a, for lack of a better word, something akin to a mass spectrometer that worked in real time and they could run seawater through it and give us a vast amount of data about the water chemistry. So we can do that in real time while we're looking at all the organisms, while we're looking at all the other sort of more traditional meteorological and oceanographic data. And then we had very precise inertial guidance systems on board that could detect uh, the dynamics relative to the sea state. And we could back that out coupled with a veripause, um, a hexagon systems veripause uh, precision GPS that was giving us ship position down to sub centimeter in real time. So all that data coupled with the cameras, we could do a lot of uh, sort of looking at sea state, the wave field, and, and then also back out sort of the shape of the sea um, if it weren't moving, right? So where the height of the sea was at that time and taking into account for tides and kind of give that data back um, for climate change, people looking at sea level rise. And then of course we talked about intelligent navigation and then uh, one of our favorites was the hydrophone. So we had a series of models that um, IBM made in concert with the Plymouth Marine Lab and the University of Plymouth and the um, Jupiter Foundation in the West Coast of the United States. Um, and they modeled all different types of uh, cetaceans and pinnipeds. And we deployed those models on the edge and we're listening. So whenever we would detect a a certain species or perhaps uh, a group of animals or um, something unique, the ship would record that data and then it would also pick up any other visual data, tag it, and put it to the side so we can analyze it along with any other water quality or water chemistry data. And um, at the end of the day, one of the things we're looking at in one of the next deployments is actually following um, within the boundaries of the Marine Mammals Act, following various um, groups of cetaceans and doing a longer term research project with an unmanned vessel. Uh, but the acoustics is very important in, in, in the ability to detect them. But it was really interesting. We just thought we've been going through terabytes of data that we got when the ship went out. It went out about 500 miles and came back. Um, we've repaired it now and we're getting ready for our next move. Um, we, we found a few things the other day that the AI flagged up as potential uh, uh, marine mammal sightings and or detections and we were able to just ask it to show us the video and it spit out these uh, fantastic sets of data and video and indeed we were able to validate optically that there were uh, those part of dolphins near the ship that we were detecting with a hydrophone so that's a good start we got to get more of that working um, but the number and type of things that we can add to the vessel doesn't really have a, a limit other than weight and power which uh, 
unfortunately, all the science is driving the instruments smaller and more power efficient. So we're, we're adding things every day um, that we can. So it's almost like a great big research ship that we've just washed in hot water till it was small enough to manage and then took all the people off. Um, and then all the data that we gather, all the information we produce, we give away free through IBM's web portal for anybody to use for any type of research they might want to do. I think that's my last one. And if you want, I could pull up a few videos. I apologize. I forgot to pull them up earlier, but I'm happy to do it. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody would love to see some video. Sure. And I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to concentrate on the videos before I start? Uh, you? Well, you can go ahead and ask me questions, and I'll, I can I can almost walk in and shoot them. So. Okay. All right. So we get some questions uh, in the chat here. Uh, so the first question, a couple people have asked this question. Um, they're, they're, the question is about whether or not you've been collaborating with the uh, the people who are uh, working on an autonomous uh, ground vehicle technology because. Yeah. Um, you know, the concept of, you know, having to avoid objects is, is similar. Um, what, what's the relationship there? Um, yeah, sort of, not much. Uh, the, well, it's hard to, this, yes and no. So we learned a lot from people who do, um, who do work with, uh, you forgive me, I lost my train of thought. I guess I can't. <laughs> Two things. Uh, no, they, 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 we, we learned a lot from, from the LIDAR people who, who do that, but we tend, we actually don't, um, we actually didn't do a lot of that. And it was mostly become, uh, it was mostly because we simply, we simply didn't need to. And, and also what we found is that the instruments that we deal with on, on a ship, are, are uh, the velocities are just so low by comparison. So a, a car might be going, you know, 70, 80 miles an hour or 40, 50 miles an hour. Our ship is quite slow as our most. And as a result, um, you know, and, and also the, the, the automobiles and ground vehicles tend to detect a completely different class of obstacle. Um, and, you know, one of the holy grails, I guess, would be a generic computer vision model that sort of detects anomalous features within a field very hard to do in a very complex field to, to try and figure out what is the thing that, you know, which one of these is not like the other. It's a little bit easier on the ocean. Um, and so we ended up making our own models. Uh, and, and again, everything runs very slow by comparison to an automobile. And while we have the additional challenge of the ocean and not working in sort of a prepared environment as an automobile does, we also have the luxury of not having to work in and amongst people uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, which is great because that's our biggest concern is, is safety. Okay, why don't I let you get the videos up uh, before I- All right, I, I got a few. Try to distract you further. <laughs> nope, I will, I will do it now. Let me see if I can share again. I've got a few that I can show you if you'd like to see them. So here we are with our final livery on the ship. Um, and she's actually, this is when she was heading out on her first uh, attempt to cross we got about as i said about 500 miles out and then a, a coupling on the drive line failed and so the ship probably could have stayed at sea forever and continued going at a very low rate but it would have taken months to get there and ultimately if it encountered any strong currents or or, or sea state it, it it could have been in the ocean for months and months and months and we felt pretty strongly about it we kind of anthropomorphized these things a little bit so it was still close enough that we could bring it back and make repairs uh, which we've done. But this is uh, our little flotilla going out with her to get her outside 12 miles because we're required to, uh, within UK territorial water, we're required to, to shadow her out until it's in international waters. Okay, so some questions are coming in now, Brad. Uh, sure. So can you talk a little bit about how the uh, ship is propelled? So what kind of fuel does sure. it use? Yep, sure. So it's the, the it's got uh, it's an electric uh, drive. So it's twenty kilowatt, two twenty kilowatt uh, electric motors uh, for redundancy. It's uh, then got a fairly substantial bank of lithium iron phosphate batteries, and then it's got a, a enough as much solar as we could put on it on a sunny day. It's only about two kilowatts that are produced, and then it's got uh, a diesel generator. So much like a like a Toyota Prius, it's uh, 
It runs on batteries and solar, and then depending on what you ask the ship to do, so if you want to go fast or you want to run all your science kit at the same time, or you uh, don't have any sun, it'll start the, the generator, charge the batteries, and then secure the generator and run on batteries until you reach a predetermined state of charge, which can be changed by the, the team monitoring it, or the actually the AI captain can change it if it desires to do so because it's getting a set of data for example, acoustic data, and it doesn't want it corrupted, so it can change its set point so that the uh, charging can be delayed until such time as it's collected enough acoustic data to satisfy the science team. And, and how fast does it does it go? It's not fast. It looks fast, but it's not fast. Max speed is about ten knots, so downhill with a tailwind, it's ten. Uh, but we the shape is designed to be hyper efficient, and so it it doesn't require a lot of uh, of propulsive power to move it, the 20 kilowatts might be overkill. Um, it, it generally goes about five knots on two kilowatts. So uh, on solar alone, it can it could just about with batteries, depending on where you are, run indefinitely. Um, but we didn't uh, design it for speed. We did it to be able to go vast distances on as little fuel as possible so that we could stay out to sea as long as as long as possible and collect data. So as a related question, um, you know, how long will it take to make the crossing? And uh, what, what do you have dates set for that yet? That's a great question. Um, we think it's probably two and a half to three weeks across, depending on weather uh, and depending on what the ship chooses as its route. We, we don't actually provide the route um, for if we're if the goal is a, this is before it had its final livery on it. If the goal is to, and I think right there, it's going about 10 knots. So if the goal is to, uh, to get there fast, we can get there fast, we can go at 10 knots. But if the goal is to do the science, do as much science as we cross, um, then we let the ship pick its speed and it's sort of somewhere between, depending on what, it's, what mission it's, what's discrete subset of the mission it's deploying at any given time is somewhere between four and seven, eight knots, uh, and its course, we give it sort of a fairly broad range of, we give it sort of a lane that was about 500 miles wide, sort of across the, so we kind of want you in here, but wherever you are in there is fine, as long as you're going in the right direction, more or less. So it had a lot of room, um, but it doesn't need to be constrained that way, and it, it would really depend on weather. So our, our plans now are at the end of October, uh, it's in the water now. It's running around in front of Harbor, getting uh, getting all set up again. Once we repaired the drive line and the various couplings, it sheared off. So it wasn't the AI stuff that broke. It was just stupid boat stuff. Um, once we fixed that, uh, it took forever to get parts. But once we did, um, we also took the opportunity to upgrade the compute systems on board. So just in the time that we locked down to the configuration about eight, nine months ago until now, we were able to almost quadruple the compute power on board for the same amount of uh, energy and, and volume. So we took that opportunity. So it's out running around now. And then at the end of October, we're going to go to Rotterdam. And we may go up to Oslo and then uh, down to back down past Rotterdam, past the UK, uh, past Plymouth, down to Bilbao, and then back, and then maybe up to Dublin. Uh, depending on the Irish authorities, there's different regulations in Irish waters um, about this type of technology. They don't like it. And um, and then after that, in April of next year is our target date for our next crossing. But we haven't got a specific day. We're just monitoring all the weather. And then as soon as we get the right window, we'll go. You have a, a, a welcoming plan, uh, a welcoming committee planned for when it arrives in P-Town? Uh, we did, but not now. So we haven't planned that yet, but we've got to go back and talk to the city and, and get that all planned up. And then the folks in Plymouth are, are also doing that too. All right. So we'll all make sure we get on your newsletter so we know when that's yep, going to Yep, no happen. problem. We updated on the uh, mas400.com site at the time. Okay. Let's, let's get some more audience questions here. So here's, a, here's one from Bruce. Um, uh, I'm going to read this one verbatim. It says, uh, as a proud retired IBMer, it seems to me that no other company has the breadth and technical technical depth to accomplish this kind of project. Would you agree? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, we didn't bother looking because IBM's been awesome. 
Um, so one of the things that I tell people a lot, um, I, I, you know, IBM is really kind of, so I've done a lot of work with the military, I do a lot of work with very large defense corporations. Um, it's as frustrating, annoying, and bordering on evil as you could possibly imagine. IBM is the antithesis of that and has single-handedly restored my faith in large corporations, and that's no exaggeration. What we, we, when we first kind of got into it with them, we were always stunned by the freedom that the people within IBM had to explore and to communicate and to collaborate and to work with outside organizations. And um, the generosity of the individuals and the corporation is really is being stunning. And that uh, it's, it's been fantastic. Um, and every time we have a problem, there seems to be a technological solution. And of course, IBM has been instrumental in the advent of, of so much technology that underpins our entire society that people often ignore. Um, and certainly in the theoretical underpinnings of AI systems or machine learning systems that go back 70 and 80 years when you did, before com the compute power existed to even implement some of these concepts. So it's been a real, uh, it's been a pleasure. IBM has been fantastic. Wonderful testimony, two, two testimonials there for, for IBM. And it is great to know that all big corporations are, are not evil. Um, all right, a couple more questions. I, I had some related questions here. I'm going to combine into one. So we're getting questions about uh, what you know about how the ship will handle in high seas, like during a hurricane, and what would happen if it capsizes. All things we think about all the time. Uh, so if it capsizes, we're screwed. Sorry, there's no easy way to say it. So we try not to do that. Um, you know, it's a tri hull and it doesn't want to flip back over. So, and it won't. So we're, we're going to try not to flip it over. But we're also fine with putting it at risk. So we're, we're definitely part of the reason we're not going now is because we're looking at the storms that are moving across the Atlantic with the weather company on a day to day basis. And it's like, pretty active hurricane season. So, so um, you know, there might be a time when we sail it through a hurricane on purpose, but, uh, you know, not quite yet. So, but we also understand, you know, the, the ocean is gonna do what it's gonna do. And we have very little control over any of that and none in fact, other than to pick our moment. So uh, it's, it performed very well in, in, in pretty rough seas. When we were escorting it out the first time we had a boat, we saw that little boat that was falling was a 10 meter vessel. And we were out off the Sillies about 12 miles and, and uh, a hardy couple of guys on that boat. They, they were in, it was about sea state four touching on five. And they, their only remark was that they really wished that they had been on the Mayflower because it just looked so still by comparison to their boat pounding up and down. So it's designed to sort of cut through. Um, what worries us about that design is that, as you guys noted, it won't, if it capsizes, we're sunk. But I'm more worried, not so much about it uh, rolling over, I'm worried about it pitch pulling. So if it gets into a very high sea state with steep waves, if it goes down the backside of a wave, because it's wave piercing, depending on the, how steep the wave is, it could plunge and then turn over what we call pitch pull. Um, we would obviously try to avoid and that's why we have real-time weather on the vessel. So it's talking to the weather satellites, it's looking at its own weather stations and it's factoring all that into its dynamic path plan. But you know, 10 knots is not gonna, you know, it, it depends on where you're going. If you're going to Boston and there's a hurricane off the Bay Capes and you know, you have X hours to go and X hours for the, 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 the big upset to get to you. Uh, I mean, the ship will have to make a decision, um, hopefully the right one, but there's only so many places you can run. Uh, at slow speed. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Um, I, I think so. Um, uh, and um, speaking of running, we've got a question here about whether or not the ship can go in reverse. Yep, it can back up. Yeah, no problem. Okay. No, we, don't, we don't back up very often, but... <laughs> Okay. You don't want to go backward, only forward, right? Well, we, yeah, I mean, we do back it into its slip once in a while. So it's got a bow thruster on it that you can't see when it's there in those videos. So it can, it can maneuver, surprise, you know, for a trimaran, for that sort of layout, it can maneuver fairly effectively in very close quarters at low speed. So yes, it can reverse and it does have a bow thruster so it can rotate on its own axis if we need it to. 
does the does the ship fly a flag or have yep, any information aboard such that if other vessels uh, come across it, they're able to understand what it is? Yeah, so it's a U.S. flag vessel, um, and it's got all the appropriate markings and stamps and plaques for that. Um, it has its uh, a AIS, I think, and its registration is broadcast there. Um, it should be noted that in the like six days we were at sea when we were out and we had to come back, uh, we never got within 50 miles or more of another ship. So, you know, there's not a lot out there. So uh, there was no, nobody to look at it. But, if, but if, a, if another ship came across it and wanted to, you know, say ahoy, um, would it, would it be that, able to- That's a good question. So one of the things that there's no law on this, there's no regulations, but many different countries are doing it and we're, we're dealing with it on the UK and the US side. So one of the things that we'll probably have on in the spring is a, is a reach through VHF. And we actually have been working with this group. You probably know them, RTCM. They're a nonprofit uh, radio telecommunications group in the United States that sort of sets standards for communication protocols. And so they've been collecting gigs and gigs or terabytes and terabytes of, of marine VHF data. And so one of the things we're doing is we're, we're starting to build models so that we, the ship can understand, we'll have a VHF receiver, can understand when it's being spoken to on a radio, and then it can speak back. And so it's when it's hailed, it can then talk back or it can initiate contact if somebody's taking bizarre action or not looking or um, but then you get into all the really wonderful stuff that's fun to do research about which is how do you get an ai to understand the diff when somebody lies so if you have two ships if you have our ship and another ship and the other ship's approaching and it's going to intersect it in a way that violates coal regs or perhaps cause a collision um and our ship then might call it and say, you know, ship such and such, if it can tell what it is, right? If it's got an AIS, but it may or may not, it may just call it uh, by descriptor um, and says, hey, what are your intentions? And it says, oh, I, sorry, I was, uh, wasn't looking at what I was doing. I was having lunch, I'll turn. I'll turn to, to, to port now, no problem. And then it doesn't. And it keeps, you know, what, is, what, is the, what does our ship do, right? So its primary directive is not to, not to initiate a collision of any sort. So it'll, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to hit it, you can, you'll have to proactively do it. But um, those are the, the communication things opens up all sorts of weird things. Now, given the stability of the iridium comms that we've had in the past, we can, we, we should be able to reach through and actually talk to people. And it does have a, a loud board. So we could, we can do it with 4G now, but we can loud hail people as well. We can like literally, hey, what are you doing? Get away from my boat. Um, but we don't tend to worry about pirates either because yeah, I'm more worried about fishermen than I am about pirates. Not a lot of pirates anymore. All right, well, Brett, um, I, we've, we've still got questions here and I, I've got a million and I'm sure we could talk well, about hey, give me, give me, give me at least one, Give me at least one more. <laughs> We're actually out of time though. So um, okay. I wanna um, give you the last word here and uh, is there anything you'd, else you'd like to, us to know about the Mayflower autonomous ship that we don't already know? Gosh, I don't know. I'm loquacious, so hopefully I gave you a lot to think about, but I just appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. It's my favorite thing I get to do all week. And if any of your folks have um, more questions, then you know, you feel free to give them my email address or, or aggregate them and send them to us, and we'll work our way through them. We have some frequently asked question documents that we can send out to. And um, we can use the septopus. Yeah, you could you could talk to Artie. Uh, and yeah, and feel free to to do that. And he's kind of weird. And uh, you know, we'll feel free to follow us on mas400.com. And uh, hopefully, everybody will come down to see us when we're in Province Town. We we will be looking forward to that. Brett, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Um, and I'll send this back to Bert. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Thank you, Brett. That was just fascinating. Uh, very, very cool stuff. I cannot wait to be in Provincetown when you when you arrive there. Thank you again very much. And thanks all of you for being here today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.